the uh, Ivanti patch for Windows. Uh, it says server standard, it can patch workstations at the same time too. So we're gonna start with kind of the patching side of things. Uh, and then we'll kind of jump into the suite side of things too, because this one seems to be where the majority of demand is at the moment, uh, especially for things like uh, that come around um, that have been kind of like uplifted by things like WannaCry and different vulnerabilities and ransomware like that at the same time. Basically, anything that exploits a vulnerability, then uh, this product has been very successfully rolled in to uh, to help remediate those situations at the same time too. So basically, the primary primary feature uh, behind this is that uh, it patches. Um, the vast majority of vulnerabilities for a very large list of vendors. So not just the uh, Microsoft and different things like that too, but it also does a lot of third party vendors beyond that, things like Adobe, Wireshark, uh, Java, the various different browsers you have out on the network. The idea behind it, uh, behind it is you can patch the vast majority of products uh, that are actually going to be on the network all in one with uh, a variety of different flexible ways uh, at the same time too, which is basically what this uh, product primarily focuses on uh, at this moment. And I just want to um, jump back a little bit on this side of things, uh, just to basically come back here, because this is the, the primary area that I actually like to talk about. So this product, it does patching, and one of the first things we always get asked around the, the patching side of things is basically how flexible is it? How, how can we do it in various different ways? Because pretty much every customer I've ever given this to does it slightly differently. So everyone has different requirements, and uh, this product is also very good, very flexible uh, around that at the same time too. So just number one, Grouping of the machines is very easy to do. If you do wish to patch, for example, up here you can see your whole domain or your entire network. Uh, you can basically select all of it and you can patch all of it all at once, should that be your choice. If you prefer to do a certain subnet or you want to do it by um, different office or maybe you want to do it by um, different AD groups or you want to do it by uh, basically different, uh, different departments. So if you want uh, like marketing and finance and technical to all be done separately, you can do that on that side of things. Or if you prefer to cluster all your SQL or exchange service together in a group, you can do it from that way too. And it also allows you to create test groups as well. So maybe you want to take a machine from all those various, various different groups uh, and you want to test against them first before, before basically rolling out to the other machines at the same time as well. So you can basically group the machines as needed. But once those machines are actually grouped, you've basically got a vast different options on the left, on the right hand side here, sorry, about what you actually want to do with the operation. So this product can be as manual or as automated as you basically want it to be. And as I said before, it's quite flexible. So the first thing it does is it does what they call a scan type over here. So it scans for basically vulnerabilities on these machines. Now this product basically works from an agent list and an agent based um, scanning protocol. So it can either basically do this uh, agentlessly as long as certain services and certain ports are actually open. Uh, and it can basically scan and patch the machine completely agent agentlessly. Or if you do have an agent on the machine, it's especially good for machines like laptops who leave in the office. That basically allows additional configuration, things like patching through the cloud and stuff like that uh, can be done at the same time too, especially useful for machines that are basically uh, leaving the land, so to speak, and maybe don't have a VPN connection back in or uh, something along those side of things. Basically, coming back to the template, you can tell it when you want it to scan, whether uh, once, immediately, or reoccurring at the same time too. So maybe you want this scan to uh, occur every, after every single uh, Microsoft release day, or for example, after Adobe does releases and different things like that. So you can make it a daily or a weekly scan, uh, or even a monthly scan at the same time too, as you wish it. And this is basically going away. Apologies for that. It's basically going away, scanning the various different machines for the vulnerabilities on those endpoints. What it then does is it says, okay, I want to stage, stage the actual deployments. So when it comes to the actual pushing down of the patches, you can basically specify in various different ways. So you scan it, you found the vulnerabilities against those machines, but maybe you also automatically want those patches to be pushed down to those machines too. So you can basically come in here and say when you actually want um, the packages to actually be deployed to the actual machines. So the patching doesn't occur yet, but the packages to be locally residing on those machines, it can be done, for example, um, at a later date, or it can be done immediately after a scan, or it can be scheduled uh, at the same time too, should it be required here as well. And then after that's done, you can then come down here and say what you want to do with the execution of those deployment packages. So this is the actual patching. Um, and you can set different templates up here at the same time too. So different templates normally are different um, configuration settings you can set in here. So like a normal uh, agent deployment uh, template could be something like um, uh, I want, for example, uh, there to be a reboot only after the patches go through. You may now have another <coughs> server group, for example, that says I want a reboot to occur before any patching occurs. Or you may have something that says, for example, 
um, maybe these machines here, I want them to patch every third party vendor, but I don't want them to patch Microsoft. So within this, this deployment template, you can basically specify what you actually want to do and also how you want to control the reboot and the patching cycle uh, at the same time too. So all the scripting, everything else that consolidates all those third party um, vendors and their patches together is automatically done in the background. And basically this is all put together in the template. So if you had this template here and you said, for example, install the patch in immediately after the staging, what this basically means is it would scan the machines, find the vulnerabilities, download the updates, and immediately patch them at the same time too. So if you had a test group and you wish them to be immediately patched with patches that are available, you could do this, for example, and make it completely automated. Uh, at the same time too, at any stage here, you can actually ramp it back to basically say, you know, do not schedule, do not execute. And what that basically means is it will get to that stage, get to that stage, and it will sit there and wait. Uh, and then basically you can come in here and uh, manually do it at the same time as well. So you can actually come in here and uh, see the various different uh, machines and then decide which what you actually want to do uh, at the same time as well. So just to give you an idea, when it actually does do a, a scan of the machines, it comes up with a list like this. And for example, if you don't choose to do the automatic deployment, you have, for example, you've got different machines over here. Like I've got a machine called uh, L67 here. It's got uh, 155 installed patches. It's missing uh, 93 and it's got eight end of life products on it at the same time too. It's currently agentless, there's no agent sitting on it. So for example, if I did come into this machine, I told it to scan and even download those patches, I can then come in here, I can look at all the patches down at the bottom here, I can right click on a patch and deploy that specific patch if I want to just do one patch, for example, for that machine, or I could just right click on this and say deploy all the missing patches. So uh, don't feel that you have to have the automation in there or else nothing gets patched. It's very easy to come in here uh, select multiple machines if you don't want to do it from a group menu and basically patch all those machines at the same time as well. Um, so that could be done too. So you can do it as automated as needed or as manual uh, needed at the same time as well. And of course, you can schedule this should it be required uh, at the same time too. That can be done as well. <coughs> so basically, that's kind of um, around the, the schedule, the patching, what it goes through. Um, it does, of course, deal with different things on the Windows environment. It does also have uh, quite a, a few additional features when dealing with VMware environments too. So if you do have clients that have VMware environments and you're actually patching the virtual machines that are sitting on the host there, number one, um, this patching software actually will patch, for example, um, those virtual machines quite happily and it'll do physical machines too. But with those VMware virtual machines, what it can also do is you can actually, in those templates, you can actually specify it, for example, to do a snapshot before the patching actually occurs. So it does a snapshot automatically does a patching cycle, and that way you automatically have that snapshot in place should it be required later on too. And also in addition to that, you can also have the host level uh, requesting updates as well. So the actual host, if it requires updates, um, it can basically ask the host to actually do an update and update the host at the same time too. So there is a little bit more configuration uh, around VMware that can actually be uh, configured and, and put in there at the same time too. Uh, unfortunately, it's not there for the Windows Hyper-V environments but it is there for the uh, VMware side of things. And again, it can be configured as needed. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, so a couple of questions. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, so the first thing is the scan that uh, this uh, tool does. So, uh, I mean, it's default it, that comes with the tool or can we define the scan? I mean, does it cover everything uh, uh, that is there that needs to be checked or can we define the scan or can we you know add something that can be scanned as well yeah absolutely so um what it basically does is it scans for the vast majority of uh, vendors that are already listed out there whether it's a critical update a recommended update a service pack across a great number of vendors but if you do have like custom software so bespoke software that's been written for a, normally a very individual company, you can actually import software here at the same time too. Uh, and then um, it, this is more manual work, um, but you can basically have it looking for like a registry key. If it doesn't find that registry key, you know, for example, that that software is not installed. And then you can build a package for the installation of that custom software uh, into this product and push it out. So while this does cover a huge range of vendors, you can actually pull in your own uh, MSIs and things like that and put your own scripts against it should it be required to as well. So yes. Okay, and the next question is: so the it uh, it's uh, applicable or this tool runs on only the Windows server or uh, I mean you said that it can run on um, you know uh, applications the uh, browsers that we use, but does it work on um, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, the database servers, application servers, different application server, different database says. So what is the, uh, you know, what are the components? Mean, do you mean non-Windows servers like Linux? Yeah, so I wanted to know, I mean, what uh, server type it supports and I mean, what uh, additional things can be uh, supported by this tool? So, so basically from um, like a supported OS side of things, uh, we're, we're going to look at another product that supports more than this, but this one specifically is kind of made for service and data centers. Uh, and this one supports pretty much everything from like uh, Windows XP 2003 all the way through to Windows 10 and 2016. So, and the vast majority of uh, pretty much all the versions of Microsoft operating system that go through that too uh, are basically supported on it. Um, this product here only does Windows, as it says from the top, of anti patch for Windows. We do have another patch product, which we'll be looking at um, next, that basically does support additional operating systems for patching. So that product supports things like if you have a client that has like Macs or uh, Linux servers or Unix servers and stuff like that, or has Ubuntu clients they want to patch, then that product does it too. So this product's primarily for Windows, uh, and it supports um, vast, vast majority of uh, in-date um, and even things that are like XP and 2003 operating systems are supported there too. But for example, we do have a product that supports other operating systems outside that as well. So uh, we'll be looking at it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. No problem. Uh, any other questions for anyone else before we continue? Okay, perfect. No problem. If you guys want to ask questions at the end, that's completely fine. Don't feel, uh, you know, if you want to ask during it, perfect. If you wish to first wait to the end, that's fine too. Uh, anytime, jump in. So basically just looking at this, you can see you've got the machines, you've got the patches at the same time too. You've also got your, um, I haven't done a scan against this one, but you basically, if you want to, you can actually run a scan so you can see all the software that's actually on this machine, as well as all the hardware that's on this machine at the same time too. So you can basically find different uh, different patches and different scans at the same time as well. I think it may actually be, no, I haven't run that one either. So you can basically find all the so software that's installed on there and all the hardware that's actually limited, uh, linked to that machine. Uh, at the same time as well on that side of things and basically just coming back to this if i just come back to the uh, patching side of things you can also see just because we did talk about it a little bit um the different vendors that are supported here so these are the parent vendors for example on the left hand side you can see here there is quite a number of them things like for example like adobe actually have about 30 or 40 different uh, products underneath them um, but again there this is this list is always being added to at the same time as well so it's always increasing um, but as you can see here, there is quite a number of them and at the same time too, you can actually come in here and set what you would actually prefer to do with the patch cycle. So maybe you have some machines that you want to do critical and important and maybe you have other machines you actually want to do recommended on or different things like that at the same time too. So there's they're basically a different list you can come over here and again, we talked about it, custom actions can actually be put in uh, at the same time as well. So again, it allows you to patch and roll out whatever you need to. Um, you can even configure the template. So for example, if you're patching like Windows 10 machines, um, and you're worried about patching those um, almost like service pack things, like the, um, the creators updates and stuff like that, that basically change the operating system quite a bit and can break a lot of software. You could basically say, um, no, I never want you to patch that. I will manually configure a task to actually patch that, for example, and different things like that too. So that type of thing can, uh, can also be done from this menu uh, at the same time as well, which again can be quite nice because it, it can time when, uh, when things actually get pushed out or when they actually get deployed uh, at the same time. But basically, um, on this side of things, you can basically do different things around scripts. You can got uh, a different reporting schedule too. So this product actually does link in with another product called Extraction, which comes free with it, which leverages a lot, uh, a lot more graphs, a lot more data that can be outputted at the same time as well. Again, what you've seen with the patching, all of that can be scheduled from an email point of view, so you can be informed by email what, what's successful, what's not successful, or be emailed these reports at the same time as well. But just to give you an idea of some of the graphs that are inbuilt into this product, um, it gives you different things like, for example, uh, what's the, how many, uh, what, basically what patches are actually currently missing. And over here you see the top 10 vulnerable machines at the same time too. And you can see um, done by, you know, missing security patches by severity at the same time as well. So if you do have uh, situations where you need to show this or prefer to look at it, you can see from the graphs in here, or there's another product called Extraction which has much more detailed graphs. So for example, you want to say, I want to see my 2016 servers and I want to see the top 10 vulnerable ones, or I want to see what's been patched in the last 30 days or something like that. You can do that at the same time too. So that type of thing can be configured as needed. 
But kind of from a, an Avanti patching for Windows point of view, this is all I kind of wanted to show as like an overview. It does the job very well. It's very simple. It works in, in environments very well. It can work from an agentless point of view. It can interact with VMware structure quite well to patch things uh, by taking snapshots. And it can even actually do offline VMs at the same time as well, which can be quite useful. Um, and in addition to that, I did uh, speak about it earlier, but it does have a cloud platform as well. So it's not solely cloud, it can't be cloud on its own, but it can integrate to it in like a hybrid structure where it can patch from the central server and it can also patch from the cloud at the same time as well. So if someone does go home or you have maybe a remote office that doesn't link back over VPN or maybe the VPN link is too small and you're worried about it, then basically you can configure this in different ways to patch from the cloud directly rather than uh, coming to the actual central platform at the same time. So that's all I kind of wanted to show with that platform before we kind of move on to the next one. Any questions, guys, at all? Uh, no. Perfect. Okay, so I'm just going to minimize this one and come out to this one. Go on. So coming, just kind of jumping from that one, the one we just looked at, that's patch mediation. Very good for the um, kind of uh, data center side of things and patching servers and whatnot, and if you have uh, machines at home. But this is basically another platform, and this one's actually a suite. This is called the uh, Avanti Endpoint Security. It used to be called Security Suite too. And basically what this one does is um, it does have a patching module as well. But this patching module, um, in addition to the other modules we'll talk about, does actually work on different operating systems. So this is primarily for people that do have different OSs outside of Windows. So for example, this one does cover off pretty much, as you can see from this list, everything from Windows, pretty much from XP, or um, 2003, all the way up to 2016 and Windows 10, so that covers that off too. But it does have things like um, Solaris and Red Hat and Ubuntu, as well as like the Mac OSs and things like that at the top here too. So if you do have a client with uh, multiple operating systems, then this is the probably the better product to actually put into them. Um, it has a very extensive patch list, just like the previous products have shown. Um, so I'm not, not going to focus on that as much. But the main thing about this product is it does support multiple operating systems. And it also does support what they call multiple security modules from this single uh, platform and also a single agent at the same time too. And what I mean by that is if the agent's installed on an endpoint and you want to do it do patching, it will do patching there, no problem. But for example, if you wanted to do antivirus as well, it will do the patching and the antivirus from the single agent. So again, this can be quite good if there are um, customers that have um, multiple requirements uh, across different operating systems, then this uh, this solution comes into play quite nicely. But what we're going to do is, while this does have patching, I'm primarily going to focus on the three up here instead. Um, not so much the antivirus, but mainly around the application control and device control. So again, just to kind of come back to this, this one's a, a nice GUI uh, interface that you can get to from your browser. And it's basically got all the information down here. It syncs up with uh, the uh, Ivanti Cloud to pull down all the information, all the installers, all the content that you need that's all done automatically for you um, and what you can basically do from here is you can basically roll out the agents and install the agents and do the various different security modules so if you have your windows 10 machines and you decide you want to do patching and device control on them that's fine if you have like sql servers and you want to do patching and uh, application control on them you can do it too and if you have remote offices and you just want to have antivirus on them then you can do that as well so it's very flexible uh, around how this platform actually works um, and basically what you can do is it's all wizard driven and it's all done through these menus at the top. So just to kind of show you to do an asset scan, you click the asset scan there, it pops up with this wizard like this. Um, and it's very a next, next, next process to go through. It's supposed to be very easy to use. So for example, you give it a name, you tell it when you want it to be scheduled, you click on the next idea area here, you tell it what you want to scan for. So let's say for example, I want to tell it to, uh, to scan for um, just an IP range in my, my test environment. And for example, it's very quick, it's very easy, it's all next, next, next way through different scan options just because this product sometimes is rolled into environments that have ping and NetBIOS turned off. We can actually click finish without putting any credentials in. We get more information if we do use credentials, but you don't have to put credentials at the same time as well. If I can actually come into this job, we can actually see in a sec when it actually loads. So it's found, it's found my SQL01 server and it will slowly populate with um, several other servers at the same time too as it ca catches them on the various different scan jobs. And basically as soon as you've seen a server, hit the tip box, come up here, click install agent. And again, it's a very next, next, next process all the way through, roll out an agent and install whatever security modules you require at that time too. So it's very easy to scan the network and it's also very easy to roll out the agents at the same time. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of time uh, and it's quite nice and easy to do. 
uh, at the same time too. And as you can see, it's discovering more and more machines uh, on my actual network as we go through at the same time. But just basically, this whole product's wizard driven, so it's very next, next, next. It's very easy to use. It is made for administrators that have 100 jobs already, and now they're having to do take on uh, this job too. So it should be something nice and easy they can come in and use as required. But just to talk about the modules a second, that it does have the patch module, which is very similar to what we just talked about. So I'm not going to, to bore you guys with talking about that again. It does also have device control here too. So device control is all around controlling um, the physical devices that are connecting into the various different um, machines, whether it be a server, laptop, or, uh, or a desktop. And what you can basically do here is you can assign different policies over here on what they call a device class. You can assign it to whatever you want. So you've got a, a lovely list here of what you actually want to control. The vast majority of time when it comes to device control and what people are allowed to plug in, uh, people almost always want to control the storage. So what is Windows seeing, for example, as uh, storage is what they want to control. Or, for example, if you are allowed CDs and DVDs to be burned, then you may want to control this area too. But primarily, you want this area here, which is called um, removable storage at the same time too. So the removable storage devices, if I just click on it here, is basically a, anything that's basically seen as storage by the uh, operating system. So whether this is a smartphone being plugged in or USB stick or a camera, it doesn't matter. Um, you can ba it's basically seen as storage and this policy will adhere to it at the same time too. And you can do various different things like read, write and other permissions. You can also do shadowing as well. So this is um, any files that are copied to or from a USB stick. You can see the user, you can see the date, the time, the machine. Uh, all the metadata around the file, and you can actually have a copy of that file copied back to the server too. So when you're looking at these reports later on, you can actually double click and actually open up that file and see who's copied what file and actually have a look at the file at the same time too. So shadowing can be done here as well. We do also have the permission set, so it has read, write, and different things like encrypt and decrypt. So a very popular one at the moment is if you plug in an unencrypted USB stick, you can read from it, which means you can take data from that USB and pull it onto the machine. But if you want to write, so from, uh, from our perspective, that's normally like a, da a data leakage uh, policy at that stage. So if you want to write, you want to take data from our environment to put them on USB sticks, that USB stick, for example, must be encrypted. So then it can uh, allow the user to actually right-click, encrypt that USB stick with 256 AES encryption, put a password on it, uh, and then once that's done, then suddenly they're able to write to it. But until that occurs, they're not able to write to it at that stage too. So different things like that can be applied um, with this product at the same time as well. And it can basically be done by clicking next here, for example, you come through to this, what you're going to allow the read and write, so maybe I'm going to allow read and encrypt, and down here under encryption, I'm gonna say unencrypted, so if it's unencrypted, you can only read it and you can only encrypt it. I would then probably create a second policy, which would look like this, and what it would basically do is it would have read, encrypt, and also write at the same time too. So as soon as it actually is seen as a self-contained encryption that has 256 AES encryption on it, and it's basically it's an encrypted device, I'm then able to write to it at the same time as well. So different things like that can be configured um, across this. And also on this side of things as well, you can tie it to various different uh, users, AV groups, uh, as well as endpoints uh, themselves, for time to machines, and groups on this side. So if you want to tie a device control policy to anything that's Windows 10, you can do that too. If you prefer to tie them to maybe the domain users group, you can do that as well. If you want to tie a policy to, to basically everyone on there, um, you could do that as well. So you could have one policy that's very restricted for domain uh, users, and then maybe you have um, another AD group that's basically allowed to use U USBs, for example, and you could have another policy tied to that group. And then you could have another policy that's much more flexible that's tied to the domain uh, admin group, for example, to allow admins to do uh, various things that normal users can't. So you can basically tie this device control policy to whichever um, type of devices or groups at the same time you want to do and lock down what you need to lock down. Uh, at the same time. Again, we do have some customers that just do auditing. So if you want just auditing enabled, you can do that as well. So that's uh, not a big deal. Um, you can basically have enforcement or just auditing just to see what's going to or from uh, in that case as well. And of course, I talked about passwords earlier. If it's encrypted and passworded with this product, then basically you can recover the password too. And if the machine is offline, so you can see over here, grant temporary permissions. If, for example, someone's over in, um, let's say Australia or something like that, they've got no uh, network communication back to the server, just by talking over the phone, because there's a mathematical um, engine at, at both ends, you can basically, by selecting the same options at both, both ends, you do a challenge response, 
and they can gain permissions for device control without uh, any network communication at the same time too. And this product does operate very well offline. It doesn't need to be completely online the entire time in order to be able to lock down. So it's, uh, it's quite good with offline uh, necessary work as well at the same time too. That's kind of the device control. That's all I kind of wanted to show there. The other area as well is very similar to device control. It's also called application control too. So again, just like we've got two patchings, we've also kind of got two application controls. So if you do have a customer that wants application control and they want patching at the same time, again, this works very well. But for example, just very briefly on the application control side of things, what you basically do is you create an auditor. It audits all the files on a machine. You can then take all those files and lock them down. And what that basically does is anything that was running one minute ago will continue to run one minute later after the lockdown comes into place. The big question once you've created that whitelist for that machine or that group of machines though, is what happens when something changes on those machines, whether from someone installing something locally or uh, installing something over an RDP session or something like Office is updating or Adobe Reader is updating or something like that. And that's where this area called trusted change kicks in. So trusted change on this side of things is um, kind of the automated way of allowing things to change on the system um, that you've agreed to, so to speak. So for example, one of the things I've got under my trusted change is what we call uh, Windows Updater. So if I'm going to allow the operating system to update itself, so most of the time you're going to use this product or another product to patch them, but maybe if they're going to patch directly, I want to allow that too. You can come in here and allow that. And that's actually called what they call a trusted updater. So you can actually list different trusted updaters for things like um, the Windows. If Adobe is going to be updated directly or Java, you can allow them as trusted updaters. Things as well like uh, the antivirus agent. So the antivirus agent when eventually, um, if you're not using the antivirus in this product, maybe using another antivirus engine, uh, an agent on there, when the agent upgrades, you can actually add that as a trusted updater. So it's whitelisted for that version, but when it, it changes to a different version, that version is uh, automatically whitelisted at the same time too. And if you, for example, do trusted updates for things like the patch remediation product in, in here, for example, or the other product you saw, the, the previous uh, Ivanti Protect product, um, anything that's patched by that product is also automatically whitelisted as well. So you're making changes to the operating system, but it's coming from a trusted update or a trusted source, and therefore it's allowed to make that change. If it comes from another direction that's not allowed, like from email or web or a USB that's plugged, been plugged in or something like that, then it will be, or a share or a network share, for example, then that can be blocked at the same time too, because it's not on the whitelist and it's not a trusted updater. Um, it's basically going to be blocked at the same time as well. There are other areas as well allowing trusted. So if you want, if you are allowing a certain publisher to update, you can add them in. If you've got a certain area like, um, like uh, if you've got a, uh, an application that makes thousands of thousands of temporary files and then deletes them a minute later, that type of thing is very difficult to control uh, with application control. So you, it, this is leaning away from security, but more towards usability. You can basically allow uh, anything that runs in that path uh, to actually allow to run without application control. So it's still application control on the machine, but that area isn't being controlled uh, at the same time too. And we've also got this area here as well called local authorization. And this is exactly as it says, anyone who's locally on there, either sitting down in front of the machine or on, a, on an RDP session or something like that. So most of the time it's going to be administrators. Um, if any of them are, are on it, you can actually allow local authorization. And what this basically means is any changes they make is allowed to do because you can take this policy and maybe tie it to, for example, like the domain admin group. So if you're part of the domain admin group, instead of being blocked, you'll be allowed to install um, software, for example, and it will automatically be added to the, the whitelist at the same time too. So this is just about making the product very secure at the same time, but making it flexible too. So if you do have publishers, you do have admins that are RDPing that are installing software, it allows those changes to be made whilst keeping everything uh, secure at the same time as well as you're going through it. And basically this, this one works, it works from the single agent too. So the patching, the, the device control, the antivirus, all works from a single console and a single agent. So again, all of this is ha happening from that uh, one single agent at the same time too. That's kind of the application control here. And the last module on here is called antivirus. Um, basically, it's the Ivanti antivirus engine. The actual pattern file it uses in the background. So the actual um, mechanics come from uh, Ivanti development, but the pattern file using to do lookups comes from another AV vendor. The other AV vendor, if you need to look it up from a comparative, AV comparative side of things, is actually called Bitdefender. So they actually pull it from, the, from that vendor at the same time too. And configuring this product is very easy. Uh, it's basically 
down to the antivirus policies here. So basically, when you're creating a policy, you create either a real-time policy or a scheduled policy. And what this basically allows you to do is you can come in here. If I just uh, quickly just uh, show you one of them. It's a very next, next, next policy, uh, process. And basically, it allows you to do different things that you normally do with antivirus engines, which, for example, attempt to quarantine, different things like that. Signal alert, should it scan archives? If it's a local user or a remote user, should it scan and write or should it scan and read, write and execute? Different things like that can basically be uh, put in at the same time as two and be configured as needed. And on this area here, you can put different things like exclusions. So again, there's probably things, maybe things like OSTs and PSTs that you want to actually exclude. So you can exclude them from here as well. And of course, scanning locally attached um, devices. So this is scanned if you decide to copy or paste or read and write anything to the machine, it's scanned by the real-time scan anyway. But if you want that USB to be scanned before it's allowed access, you can tick this on. The only um, warning I would give is people are plugging in bigger and bigger USB sticks these days. So if you are pl plugging in, for example, that's something like a, a terabyte, uh, like external storage device, that's going to take some time to scan, especially if there's lots of files on there, it's going to take some time to scan it. Um, so sometimes the user can get a little bit annoyed because they plug it in and, you know, 30 seconds later, it's still not ready yet because it's still scanning that very large machine with all those files. Um, so again, if that is a problem and you prefer to leave it to the real-time scanning instead, you can uh, you can untick that as well um, as basically needed. And again, you can tie this policy to various different endpoints or groups at the same time too. So maybe I just want to tie it to anything that's Windows 10 or 2016 or Windows 7 or 8. I can basically do that as well uh, as required. So it's very easy to configure, very easy to tie down. Um, and again, it works from the single agent and this platform at the same time too. So a single platform, single agent, and it kind of works across all four of these different products, whether you're dealing with patch, device control, application control, or antivirus, all of them are on a single agent, all of them are managed from the same management, all the updates and everything automatically come down from the cloud. And again, it works across the various different operating systems, not just Windows, but other operating systems like Linux, Unix, uh, Ubuntu, uh, different things around Mac as well. So if you do have a client that does have different operating systems, does have a requirement for multiple security modules, then this one's perfect. If it is just for patching and just for Windows, um, then the, the basically the iVanity Protect may be a little bit better, or if they've got a, a, a VMware environment, they want to be able to patch using those additional features like creating a snapshot, patching offline VMs, then you can basically use that product uh, instead at the same time too. That's all I kind of wanted to show on the Ivanti endpoint security side. I know that was quite a lot because it is basically four security products in one, uh, in one single agent. But before we start talking about App, uh, AppSense, the last one, are there any questions uh, regarding that platform? Yeah, so uh, one question is, uh, you said that this antivirus, uh, you know, takes uh, the updates from an external antivirus engine. So how rich is the, uh, you know, this, um, Signatures. Say, for example, if I uh, compare any other antivirus solution like Symantec, Trend Micro, so forth, uh, and compare to this uh, engine, so does it have those rich kind of uh, signature base uh, uh, updates? Uh, you know, uh, so that I mean, so I'm I'm making a comparison. Basically, say for example, if a vendor comes to me or a uh, or a uh, our version comes to me and they want the scope is basically to uh, deploy an antivirus uh, and a patch management solution. So, uh, so I will propose them the uh, event endpoint security, but then I need to be uh, sure that the antivirus here is going to, you know, uh, have those rich signature base that we get in other, uh, you know, only antivirus uh, softwares. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, this one, it does have all the heteristic scanning, it does have the behavioral monitoring, it does do the sandboxing. So it does um, everything that the other antivirus uh, basically engines actually do at the same time as well. Um, you know, this is primarily it's focused around the multiple security modules, like you said. So if it was just an antivirus side of things, then, you know, maybe there's, um, maybe they would want to go one of the other big vendors. But <coughs> one thing I actually did do is they have pulled um, a lot of the, the pattern files and technology straight from Bitdefender. That's what the OEM was set up for, just because they didn't want to. It's very competitive in that top 10. Um, you know, the percentage is normally very small between the catch rates, but it's very competitive. Yeah. So, um, you know, 
they have got it here, but they've also got the, the all the scanning in the background that does catch pretty much everything that Bitdefender alone also would uh, would catch at the same time too. It's just they, the request actually originally when this product came out, it didn't have antivirus, but the request was always it would be nice if the antivirus was in that single agent because the what the main feedback they got from this product was they wanted fewer agents, smaller impact on the machines. So that's why they decided, okay, we'll bring in the antivirus too. Uh, they saw Bitdefender was basically the top antivirus for many, many years, or in the top three for many years. Uh, okay. And then they had the discussions, and then they, they designed this antivirus around it, and they basically uh, leased it from uh, from Bitdefender. Okay, got it. And uh, I heard you say that all these updates and all that uh, comes from the cloud. So every server that is sending the uh, update to uh, this uh, is based in cloud, right? Yep, so the update server itself, so like the license replication, system replication, everything updating the patch content is all coming straight from the cloud. So when Adobe releases or Microsoft releases new updates, it's pulled immediately down to this platform. It knows which machines, for example, have Microsoft, which has Adobe, which has Java, and it will immediately run a scan on them and then report back here. For example, you see the unremediated critical vulnerabilities, it immediately reports it back to you and then you can uh, patch them as needed. So this product is actually on, is actually on premise but it does link with the Ivanti cloud to basically pull all those updates uh, okay. down to the platform. So the, uh, just, just to add to that, the uh, patches don't come directly from the vendors. They, uh, they go through Ivanti, um, who do testing on them for checking against um, critical uh, vulnerabilities in those patches. They, they test them for conflict. Um, they receive the updates two weeks before general release uh, from the vendors. Um, so they get time to test them, make sure that you know there's no conflicts with other applications that they're, they've got patches for. Um, they also uh, put a, a patch fingerprint on there as well, um, just a, a unique identifier which gives you further information so that if the patch fails, it can tell you why it failed. Mm. Um, and they so there's a lot of additional things that they do um, to make the, the, the patching much simpler. Um, one of the other critical things that they do is that the um, is that as well as testing for conflicts and being able to put a patch fingerprint on there, they they remove the bloatware from some of the updates. So like Adobe, for example, they always comes with the McAfee free um, scanning tool. Uh, they remove any bloatware from the vendor updates before uh, releasing, so you don't have lots of uh, bloatware going out with your updates. Okay. So I just I just thought I'd add that to the, the to the conversation. Uh, I thought that might be a, a good thing to add in at that point. Yeah, got it. Perfect. So we basically have one more to show, which is AppSense. Um, we don't have it up and running here, but I'm basically just going to talk about it because it's very similar to what you've seen with the application control too. But any more questions on the Avanti endpoint security platform before we move on? No, I'm good for now. Perfect. Okay, so um, the last one, I have to apologize. Um, the server's actually basically shut down for it at the moment, uh, so we can't actually share it, so apologies for that. But basically, uh, it's again, it's application control, but it works in a slightly different way. Um, again, similar to what we've got two patching solutions, it's got two antivirus ones, uh, application control ones. So if someone is looking for very specific application control or something that works in this way, this is why uh, basically AppSense works uh, a little bit uh, differently to this product. So the way AppSense works is it does create, for example, a whitelist, um, and it does enforce that whitelist at the same time too. It's very similar to this, what this product does here. But what it does do instead is instead of auditing and basically uh, allowing files through um, trusted updaters and stuff like that, what it does is it will do permission checks instead. So it will know who owns the file and then it can elevate privileges on those various different files. So this can be useful to give people um, more, basically more permissions on their machines, or also to take away permissions at the same time too. So just to give you an example, if you have a normal user on the machine and uh, they have something like GoToMeeting or Cisco WebEx or um, anything like that side of things, and maybe they have to update it themselves, so there are times they need to, but they get prompted for admin credentials and they don't have admin credentials. What you can basically do with AppSense is you can say anything from this vendor, so let's say anything from Citrix or anything from Cisco or the WebEx, or you can find the executable and, and make it very specific. But what you can basically do is you can take those different products and say, 
for these products, you're able to actually do the installation, you're able to do those updates and those upgrades at the same time too on your machine, despite the fact that you're not a domain admin uh, at the same time as well. And the reverse on it too is if you've got domain ad admins out there, um, but you don't necessarily want them to be able to do certain things, maybe like um, you know shut down a server or be able to open an RDP session or something like that, you can actually go into, uh, for example, th those machines or those accounts, <coughs> and you can actually say, I actually want to pull back the permissions. So you can actually take away permissions uh, from that side of things as well. Um, and it can be done from pretty much anything that requires elevation of privileges or de-elevation of privileges can actually be done at the same time. So you can basically allow it or disallow it as needed, um, which can be very useful and it's a very powerful tool. Um, and it just basically means that if you do have domain admins, you can restrict their, their powers. And if you do have normal users, and they have things that need to be updated at the same time too, uh, and they, you don't want to give them an admin account, you don't want to give them a local admin account, you can actually ele elevate those privileges with this product at the same time too. Um, and that's basically the core of the product, that's the essence of it. And it just allows you to basically keep a very secure environment, it keeps whitely steady, keeps you locked down at the same time too. But again, it allows your users to install stuff if they need to install things, or to pull back uh, admin credentials again at the same time too, should it be required. So you can almost create like power users in between users and admins. Um, or domain admins as needed, so to speak, on that side. And that's the kind of the main difference between this uh, App AppSense application control and this application control, just because AppSense is dealing with the privileges and permissions of the actual users, whereas this application control you can see in front of you deals more around we're going to whitelist um, all the files and then it's certain publishers that are going to be allowed or trusted to be allowed. So that's more from a patching point of view, and the AppSense is more from a um, company-wide certain people need to allow allow to do things and others don't uh, at the same time too so that can be configured at the same time and that's kind of like the, the core of, of AppSense it's the privilege management part that's kind of the core of the uh, the AppSense product at the same time too uh, apologies again I can't show it to you it's just that uh, that service down at the moment but kind of any questions around the privilege management or how AppSense works at all uh, no I'm good okay a couple of good examples uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples of customers that have bought the um, the former AppSense product and why they bought it. Um, one company um, had a lot of remote users, and they were having to give them previously having to give them admin credentials so they could change print drivers remotely. But that was causing uh, they got hit by ransomware because somebody downloaded something they shouldn't have done um, because they had admin credentials. Uh, what they could do with the AppSense product was they could lock down everyone's machine so they didn't have admin credentials uh, because as you know with Windows it's either you have admin credentials or you don't. Uh, what they did was they locked down the systems and they said okay we'll, we'll give you permissions to change the print drivers but only to change the print drivers and nothing else. Um, another area where we had um, quite a good um, customer was that they had developers and they, they wanted to give their developers the ability to change um, and, and being able to have admin credentials to do video coding. Um, they granted the permission for them to be able to do the video coding, but they locked the rest of the applications and the machine down so they couldn't do anything else uh, to, you know, to, to cause any problems within the network internally. Uh, I hope those examples were good ones. Um, and it, if you have any other questions around that, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, no, I'm good. So uh, one question I have for this uh, endpoint security product. Uh, so uh, take a scenario where uh, the machine is not uh, in the domain. For example, a, a organization having some regional offices with uh, five or ten people working out of that office and they are you know, not uh, in the domain, they are not connected either through VPN, they don't have an MPLS, they are just utilizing the corporate resources through the URL, through, uh, uh, you know, browsers. So in that case, how the patches uh, and antivirus signatures will reach? So if they've got no VPN and they've got no connection so they're basically almost like an isolated offline network you can actually put what they call a proxy cache in like the dmz uh, and point the agents at it at the same time too um so you can do it that way if it's required so you can actually have updates kind of going down that method it just means a little bit more manual work okay but it's possible through this product it is possible yeah 
Okay. Okay. Um, the one product that we didn't cover off was the patching for system center. Oh yes, so basically patching for system center. Uh, again, I can't show you that because that server is also shut down at the moment. <laughs> okay. um, well, server room melting. But um, basically, it's very, very, very similar to what you've seen with the previous two patching solutions. Um, and basically, what it does is if you do have if you have a customer that has system center already. Um, I found talking to customers, it's a, it's a little bit, either they love System Center or they hate it. So if they, if they hate it, then you've got the standalone platforms like this that can work. If they love it or they have someone that's assigned to it, like an SS, SCCM engineer, um, then you can actually get a, a patching module that's basically a plugin. So it utilizes exactly the same uh, management console that SCCM has itself, and it also pulls all the third party listings in. So what it basically does is it links in with the Ivanti cloud. So it's not going to the vendor, it's going to the Ivanti cloud, pulls in all the various different third party vendors. Uh, and what it basically does is it then can publish them to the same area that you would normally have for WSUS. So for what you have for WSUS and uh, Windows updates and stuff like that, will basically also have contained within it all the various different third party products uh, that basically you've stipulated. And what it basically does is it uses the SCCM agents to basically do a scan for those third party products at the same time too. So Java, Adobe, Chrome, Firefox, all those different ones like that. And what it basically does is it provides them into the area, the same area you'd see the Windows update for WSUS. And what it basically allows is it allows you to push those updates out with the Windows updates. You approve them and you push them out as you would with the Windows updates straight down through the SCCM client. So there's no additional clients and straight onto those machines to patch. So if if a customer does have SCCM already in place and they and then they like it and they, they know how to use it, then um, utilizing basically the SCCM plugin does the exact same thing. Uh, and it looks very, very similar to the two products you've just basically seen on the patching side. It just basically integrates directly with it. And it just means you don't have to stand up another server or have another agent on those machines. Um, it just means you can you can use utilize SCCM management and utilize the SCCM agent to get the updates down to it uh, at the same time as well. So again, that's there and there for uh, any customer that has SCCM or wishes to, uh, to utilize it. Okay. Any questions on that or on the SCCM side? Uh, no, I got it. All good, all good. Okay, so. Okay, um, so what I'll do is um, we'll, we'll finish off um, for today and let you go home and get some rest. Um, it's probably yeah. way past your home time. Uh, I did spot your, your colleagues left the uh, left the WebEx a little bit early, leaving you to hold the uh, hold the fort. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so what we have done a recording of this session. So what we'll do is we'll send your uh, we'll send a recording out of to everyone who who wasn't able to make the session today. Um, and then obviously we can take further questions once they've seen the recording in their own time. Um, sure. But um, if there's anything that you need specifically for us to send on to you, we can do that. Um, what I will do is I'll catch up with Sahil, uh, who didn't join the call today, um, and I will um, let him, I'll, I'll forward him a copy of this session. And if, if there's any further information you need, uh, then by all means let us know. Sure, I will do that.